as an agent, how do you take your professionalism to the next level? Well, we're gonna talk about that today. Stay tuned. This episode of Keeping It Real is brought to you by Real Geeks. How many homes are you going to sell this year? Do you have the right tools? Is your website turning soft leads into interested buyers? Are you spending money on leads that aren't converting? Well, Real Geeks is your solution. Find out why agents across the country choose Real Geeks as their technology partner. Real Geeks was created by an agent for agents. They pride themselves on delivering a sales and marketing solution so that you can easily generate more business. Their agent websites are fast and built for lead conversion with a smooth search experience for your visitors. Real Geeks also includes an easy to use agent CRM. So once a lead signs up on your website, you can track their interest and have great follow-up conversations. Real Geeks is loaded with a ton of marketing tools to nurture your leads and increase brand awareness. Visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod and find out why realtors come to Real Geeks to generate more business. Again, visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod. And now, on to our show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I am your guide and host through the show. And in just a moment, we're going to be speaking with top producer Francie Molina. Before we get to Francie, I uh, wanted to give you a couple of quick announcements. Number one, actually requests, not even announcements. I need something, but they're pretty hopefully reasonable and simple requests. Number one, tell a friend. Think of one other agent that could benefit from talk, listening to an episode with a top producer like Francie and send them a link to either our podcast website, which is keepingitrealpod.com, or just have them pull up a podcast app, search for Keeping It Real, hit the subscribe button. And the second thing is to leave us a review. Whatever app you might be listening to this show in, whether it's Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Amazon, you know, wherever else, let us know what you think of the show. Leave us a review. We read every review and comment, and it helps us improve. But enough about all that. Let's get to the main event, my conversation with Francie Molina. Today on the show, we have Francie Molina from the Francie Molina team with Compass in Westchester, New York. Let me tell you more about Francie. Francie is the team leader of the 10-person Francie Molina team in Westchester County, uh, which is just north of New York, New York City. Francie is more than an award-winning top producing agent. She's also a powerful force in the Westchester market and a highly sought after industry thought leader. Through her involvement as a women of Compass Regional Leader and also co-founder of the Women of Compass Clubhouse and a founding member of Realm Global, which is a, a worldwide luxury real estate think tank. Francie keeps her finger on the pulse of issues affecting the market. In 2021, Francie's team held the distinction of selling the most homes in the county, which is incredible because Westchester County is incredible. Uh, please, everyone visit Francie on her and her team on their website, which is FrancieMolina.com, F-R-A-N-C-I-E, Molina, M-A-L-I-N-A.com. There will be a link to that in our show notes. And also please follow her on Instagram or her team on Instagram at Francie Molina team, also link in the show notes. Francie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. I feel that, you know, when we just first started talking, I was like, I feel like I've known you for a long time. We just very comfortably started communicating. Um, and I am really, really excited to have you on the show. First, for all of our, uh, and I'm sort of geographically challenged and and my I'm a bit embarrassed to, to ask, but for anyone who isn't that familiar with New York geography, where is Westchester County? It's a great question, actually, because most people have no idea. So it's directly north of New York City. So you've got Manhattan, and then you have the Bronx, and then you hit Yonkers, and you're in Westchester. So no bridge between the commute, which is like New Jersey, you have to cross the George Washington Bridge, 
or Long Island, you're crossing either the Throgs Neck or the Whitestone. Westchester County is a suburban commutable area to New York City without a bridge, straight up parkways, highways, straight up. So it's, it's a highly sought after uh, suburban marketplace for folks who earn their living in New York City or just want close proximity to New York City. And the, it also has a distinction of being carved out of a forest. So it's really, I mean, almost every area of Westchester is just, you know, um, mature trees and beautiful uh, nature. I mean, we have bears walking in our yard and fox and coyote and turkey. And, you know, we have the distinction of like being 15 miles from New York City, but still have nature. Isn't that incredible that that yeah. you can have that that juxtaposition of yep. you know the the busiest city in in the in the country uh, and then 15 miles beyond it it's you know there's you're you're battling bears and and nature mm -hmm. um, and how lovely uh, gosh yeah. I've 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 always heard of Westchester and I've really never spent time in Westchester County so um, I I've been to um, uh, the um, oh gosh I'm so where, where um, West Point. I've been to West Point. Oh, I don't... so beautiful. That's across is... the bridge, across the okay. river. So, so beautiful. That's probably the closest I've been. And mm -hmm. that was insane. And I was like, insane. holy, uh, just so beautiful. Um, well, let's, let's learn more about you. Where do you come from? How did you get into real estate? Tell us your story. <laughs> So my story is not that exciting, but I'm from originally from Connecticut. Um, and then, uh, you know, we ended up, um, we lived in New York City, my husband and I, when we were first married. And then, you know, as soon as you're starting to think about a family, often folks, I would say 50% of the New York City population moves out for sure. um, space in schools or 30%, depending on the year. So we did the same. So we moved up to um, Irvington on Hudson, which is on the Hudson River side of Westchester County. So it's the west side of the county. And um been living there for 31 years oh and goodness. I ended up in real estate because I was a formerly in banking. I was at the Federal Reserve Bank years before that. And when I decided to, you know, had, had sort of the break in the action to kind of leave the kids and start a second career, um, my husband and I had some less than stellar real estate transactions in our <laughs> history. And I always felt, and we always felt, we're pretty type A on steroids. And we always felt like our agent um, just showed up with a key and that was really it. And the worst story was that we live on a private road in the house we're in now. And it was a few days before closing, before we even knew that. And we were responsible for maintaining the road and it's unclear who owns the road, but we, we own at least in front of it. Of, of our house. So we're responsible for all those potholes. So I, I think subconsciously I had it in my head that, you know, the bar was pretty low in real estate and I, <laughs> I, I love people, but more importantly, I love numbers and models and financial stuff. So that combination. Uh, so I decided to get my license on a whim. I'm telling you, this was not a thought out thing. I was at the gym and I thought I was going to take a real estate class. A friend said, I'll do it with you. And again, now 12 years later, um, I run a team of 10 and it's, it's been amazing. Um, it combines well, all the things I love. Yeah, but you don't just run a team of 10. You run a team of 10 that sells the most amount of property in the county. And to do that within a decade, let's let's just be honest, is is a really impressive uh, achievement. And I, you're too humble to, to sort of brag about it, but I'm going to brag about it because I think that's an incredible achievement. I've been in this industry longer than that. And I've, I've rarely, rarely seen that anywhere in the country. Um, so tell us sort of, how did you, so you talked about, you know, real estate kind of put together a lot of the different qualities that are you, um, and that you love. How, tell us how that worked. What, what did that journey look like? Well, so in the beginning, I came into the business around two, in 2010, May of 2010. So obviously the market was not the easiest there. time to no. come in. But in, in the in, in the end, it was the best of times because I could sit in the office, listen to other agents, especially when you, you know, if you want to be a millionaire, you surround yourself with millionaires. If you want to be a great agent, you surround yourself with, a, you know, top agents. So I would listen to how they did business. And because it was slow, um, you know, I wasn't, they weren't running in and out all the time. And also there still was floor time. So you could sit there and if, if the phone rang, you might have the honor of getting a lead. Um, so I spent a few years doing that. And that was really good for me because for me, this was going to be a marathon, not a sprint anyway. Even though Westchester is big, all the communities are very small. And we live and work in them and our kids go to school in them. And in my experience, most of my friends raising their kids would kind of cross the street to avoid their agent after buying the house. Wow. And that was not the kind of relationship-based business I was going to build. So had I you know, gone into a hot market and got all this business thrown at me, 
I probably wasn't prepared to do it very well. So I was glad that I had the time to learn the business before I was hitting the road running. So the first couple of years were slow. And, um, and then, you know, as I worked with lots and lots and lots of buyers from the city and worked lots and lots and lots of weekends, they referred me their friends and their neighbors. And over time it builds. I always say, if you run a relationship based business and you stay in touch, you show up and follow up, you, you start with like a little bucket of clients and that bucket becomes a storage container. And then it becomes a moving truck. And then it becomes a factory warehouse, which is the need for the team. Um, and that's how it worked out. You know, we really, my team is a part of the, com- the fabric of the communities in which we live. We're always giving back. We always show up and follow up in every way that we can. So even the newest agents on my team are still are building relationships and getting referrals from those relationships. So, it, you know, the pot just keeps getting bigger. Wow. So you really started out helping people transition from city living out to, to rural, more rural living. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, grew, I grew up in a, in a more rural environment as well. Um, so I can, I can appreciate that. But um, yeah, so, so talk about, so for the first couple of years, you, you come in, the market's kind of at the bottom at this point, which, which, <laughs> which I think you, you brought up a really good point that a lot of people exited the industry, the, the business. Um, a lot of realtors left the industry. Yeah. Um, and a lot of realtors were avoiding clients because of, of all the, of all the challenges. And, yep. and also you saw an opportunity yourself. You said that maybe your own experiences with, with realtors weren't always super positive and you're like, I can do this better. Um, or at least I can do this as well, if not better. Um, I, you know, I'm curious on since you've seen people come and go, you've seen agents start uh, and have success and not have success. Um, what what do you usually, when you bring on a new team member who's new to the industry, what do you usually have them do to sort of, you know, sort of understand that, yes, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but what are they doing day to day to kind of build that pipeline? Yeah. So all the agents on our team were basically new when they joined. One maybe had some experience, um, a little experience. We just took on a seasoned agent, the first one ever. Um, and I love new agents because if you join our team, you're 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 kind of following our credo. We chase reviews, not commissions. So you're going to learn the business before you're out there doing, uh, you know, doing much. So you're shadowing. You're you're coming to the office. You're listening to us. We know our tax rates in every community, and Westchester has amongst the highest taxes in the county. So that's really the most important thing you need to know when you're showing houses. Um, you're understanding the different lifestyles. You're learning all that, and then you're following us. You know, uh, uh, appraisals, inspections. Inspections are big in the suburbs, right? In the sure. city, it's an apartment building or a co-op. Um, and in following us around, um, learning the pr- pricing. And uh, we don't really have a firm um, time frame. Typically, I hear other teams say, oh, you can't go out and show and sell for three months. We always, that's always the goal. But somehow, um, an agent we just took on in September last year, we were going to hold her out for three months. And by November, she was out showing and selling. And she's, I will close 10 deals already. Because she, you know, it was like a sponge. There's, there's, you know, nine others to tell you how to do things. We're very collaborative. We meet every Tuesday without fail. And then we also do team time blocking and other meetups. So there's a lot of, lot of you know, a lot of hands to help. It's, it's, it's really impressive. And I'm, you know, how, just to give our, our listeners uh, some understanding of, of your volume, because I, I think it is something that, that helps provide some context. Um, tell us what does this month look like for you guys? Yeah. So I always, uh, the stat that I was so proud of the team for last year was we sold um, 153 houses. So every two and a half days we closed a house. Um, and I, I just thought they're, they're just amazing. I mean, you know, lots of the team have young children, have lots of personal things going on in their life, but they, you know, these are full-time jobs for them. They're not agents by accident. They're agents on purpose. They show up and follow up. And it's really amazing. My kids are grown. Uh, it's a little easier and they, but they, they get, get there every day and, and do it. So this month I will probably in June, we'll probably close between 60 and 70 houses. Um, but that's typical because it's a school district, you know, these are, this yeah. is a school district fire. Uh, yeah. So we have a lot going on. I think so far this year, you know, over 90 total. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Just, just incredible. And you guys go, go, go. And I love that. Um, what, what, where do you find, what's the biggest challenge right now for your group? Because I, 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 we, I don't, 
asked that question enough. And I think oftentimes people learn the most from challenges. So where, yeah. what, what do you see as the biggest challenge right now for, for your business? Yeah. Our, our biggest challenge is, um, is, is the weekends. It's, you know, especially up until, you know, end of May, a house came on, it was gone. If it lasted through the weekend, we were lucky. If it had, you know, less than 20 offers, we were lucky. So, you know, the, on a Friday night, an agent puts a house on and by Sunday, if you can't show it, uh, because you have, you're fully booked or you have something else on your schedule, perhaps a wedding or a family event, you know, sure. that client misses out on the, um, on the house, or obviously now there's a, a, a team so we can help each other, but that, that inability to schedule your life is so hard. And in COVID, we were busy throughout COVID because we were, even though we were non-essential in New York, we were showing, I, I feel like I mean, it was March 20th, by we were out showing by April 15th, we're st- sitting outside while our clients went in, but people were calling us from all over to, you know, to buy a house in the suburbs. So we were out and about. So for, you know, last like two and a half years, we really haven't had a break. So it feels like those weekend, it, the weekend is such a burden at this point. Yeah. And have, have rising rates um, affected your buyers much? Has that been a concern? Because I, and the only reason I'm bringing it up and, and I, I, I know everyone's got a different take on it, but I always think that this, this is something that I, I want. It's not that I always think I hear agents talking about rates, 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 rates. So I'm curious on how that, how, how that affects your business and how you maybe talk to maybe pre-approval letters might not really um uh, be as um well they need to be rerun right now maybe right they definitely do and i, I mean as you know a one percent interest rate increase reduces their buying purchasing power by like 12 percent. so it definitely yeah. is affecting them i will also i would also like to add because i'm hearing this everywhere i go every mastermind group meeting i'm in it's like interest rates interest rate interest rates interest rate interest rates it's also this is not really the first summer where we feel free to go do things, where families feel free to be on the sidelines of the baseball game, send their kids off to sleepaway camp kind of relatively easily, all the go on vacation. So we also feel like it's just a little bit of, a, there's a fire fatigue in the market after a really, really tough market. And people just want to live their summer normally. So if you're buying a house this summer, you're on the phone with your attorney and you're dealing with inspections and you have all this other stuff going on. So our slowdown is also somewhat driven by that. They've been in the January to June or May market. It was a nightmare. And now they're just tired. Now they're using interest rates as an excuse or just the, uh, the normalizing of the market takes a while because the sellers don't adjust their pricing that rapidly. They're talking, right. they're out on the, uh, mowing their lawn and their neighbor says, I got X for the house. So now they want Y. So it's just a bit of a normalization process. And as we all know, change in real estate is slow. So we just have to wait for people to adjust to the new interest rates, you know, get their summer plans out of the way. And, and I, in our market, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, most folks who move to Westchester want proximity to New York City, want space, schools, nature, safety, whatever it is. There's a whole litany of things you get from it. Uh, so it'll pick back up again. When you, when you meet, when you work with a buyer or a seller, um, what's the most important part of, of that first interaction? Like, what are you looking for, um, in order, because you talked about at the beginning, Hey, when you were working with, with other realtors, sometimes it was like, they were just opening doors and, and that was kind of it. Um, what, what kind of a relationship are you looking for? With your clients. Sure. I forgot to mention that when I got into the business, I had the benefit of coming into the business sort of with Zillow and with Realtor.com and Redfin and all the transparency that was occurring in the market. It obviously had started a little earlier. But so to me, the industry, it was an, an industry that was rapidly changing. And I worked with agents who had been doing it a certain way for many, many years. And as we all know, pivoting is very tough and slow. So I'm coming into an industry that, you know, everything's on Zillow, thank God. I mean, I'm not, not because it's on Zillow, but I do love the transparency of the information, especially in a county like ours, where taxes are criminal. So in fact, Zillow's taxes are wrong for Westchester County. So maybe it's not Zillow, but that they can go to the websites and find the real estate taxes, because um, that's the most important thing that we can share with our clients is the cost of living in Westchester. It is actually cheaper to live in Westchester than in New York City. Obviously, real estate's cheaper. And also, you don't pay New York City income taxes 
if you live in Westchester, even if you earn your income in New York. So that's about a three or 4% reduction for a lot of people. So it's a big benefit, but the property taxes are crazy high. And the property taxes on a $4 million brownstone in New York City is are like $2,000. So we really need to make sure they understand the difference right away. Because if they find their dream house and then they're finding out that the taxes on that dream house are, are you know 30,000, they haven't been educated. So we're always educating our clients. And when when our when we start with a new client, they get a full buyer packet full of information about Westchester and um, access to our buyer resource website, which has more information than you can digest. We're, you know, we are uh, trusted advisors on the Westchester marketplace. There's almost nothing that we don't know the answer to or can't get the answer to. Yeah, I, I think knowledge is, it's one of those hurry up and wait sort of situations where if you really want to be the person that your client picks up the phone to call, you really have to accumulate information, right? You have to accumulate Correct. knowledge. I'm curious. Um, I was, I was at a breakfast this morning. Actually, I was telling Francie, I was, I was at a breakfast this morning with a bunch of other compass agents. She's a compass agent. And we were talking about um, studying the market every day. Or, and I was curious, um, you know, do you spend time every day looking at listings, looking at the MLS? Curious if you have any habits uh, for um, for agents, because, you know, there's a lot of times agents wake up and they're like, I don't know what I should do today. So curious what you might suggest. <laughs> oh, I have habits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are an MLS region, which is very helpful. So um I look at the hot sheet more than once a day. The hot sheet is the new listings, the coming soons, what went into contract. You know, you're just, that's how you keep your finger on the pulse of the market, right? If like, if you go on our hot sheet today, there's like three pages of actives. If you went on our hot sheet, you know, um, two months ago, there'd be, you know, one, a half page of actives, right? And the pendings would have taken up the other pages. So um, definitely do that. We use market insights that Compass provides too on the market. Um, you know, how many price, I think the other day we checked Market Insights, there was like 1,076 listings in uh, Westchester active and 50% of them had a price improvement. That would not have been the case in March, <laughs> right? So just that's, that enables us to keep our finger on the pulse of things from a statistics perspective. There's also 10 of us, nine of us are producing agents. The other one is our team manager. He's like God's gift to the world. We're, we're like, so blessed to have him. He's also good at keeping track of the insights and sharing them, but also just you put, you know, nine producing agents in a room who are out showing and selling all day. We really have our finger on the pulse of what we're hearing from buyers and sellers all the time. And we're always sharing. So of course we have like the team Slack and it's running all day and people are talking about whatever. So you guys have a, you guys have a Slack channel that you're, you're, communicating and firing off questions and that's actually really smart i i have that's well it's really smart because it's a great way to for for newer agents to get answers or to collaborate or to say hey, i've got this idea and um teams have really picked up the slack i feel in the last five years or so i've started to see teams take on more of a training and support role than maybe were in the past. Um, and I, I'm seeing the burden for agents getting trained coming off of the managing broker, the person you know running uh, the office and, and pushing that more towards the teams, which I think works really well in, in a lot of cases. And it, obviously that's that's what you, you guys are doing. Um, how important do you think teams are right now in real estate? Uh, obviously you have one, so you're, you're a big fan of teams. Um, I, you know, for me, I, I've always thought that, you know, hey, two is better than one. But uh, tell, tell me a little bit about your team and, and why you built it. Sure. So if there's any solo agents out there listening or solo with an admin or team manager or chief of staff, whatever, um, I am so impressed with you. I don't know how you do it because I do feel with um, the entire U.S. population being locked down or most of it for a year or two, people's patience was, you know, their nerves were shot and their expectations didn't really meet the reality. You know, I want to see this house on Saturday at one and that's the only time I can see it. And, you know, you have five clients that want to do that. How do you pull that off? So be, I just we just when I started and after I started to have some business, I just couldn't be a solo agent anymore. I did. I built a team out of necessity because I couldn't be in 15 places at once in Westchester buyers are accompanied by the agent, the buyer's agent. A lot of listings are accompanied by the listing agent, higher and luxury listings, but still the buyer's agent still comes in New York city. The buyer's agent doesn't go with their buyers. So maybe that's a different, um, 
situation. But for us, we had to be in 50 places at once. So it, it was almost impossible to be solo and carry a, a big deck of clients, especially if you're a seller's agent too, which we do 50-50. So you've got your sellers calling you on a Saturday because someone leaves the door unlocked and you're with buyers. Um, so I became a team at a necessity. Um, and I always say this, I stole it from somebody, I don't know who, but if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. And that was really my first hire, not because I'm brilliant and not because I thought it through, not because this was a straight, perfect line. It was a very zigzag, bumpy line to, to where I am now. But, but I just found myself coming home at six o'clock or seven o'clock at night and spending like hours doing the paperwork or the emails or the keeping in touch. So the assistant was the first hire, went through a few. Now I have God's gift to the world. He's our team manager and he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, and then ha- added agents. Um, so, you know, when you have um, a team, you know, the team leader isn't the only one doing trainings, you know, the other agents can help. Um, My agents are amazing. They all take ownership to the team. They all feel a part of it. Um, Rising tides raise all ships. They're in it for the long haul. We feel like we've each built each other's careers for as long as we want to do this. Um, And we all believe in the brand. So together we're rising. And I think that I love talking about teams and I think I emailed you this, but you know, we're just, we're a collaborate without ego team. We share everything out in the marketplace. We're kind to almost everybody who um, reaches out and, (laughs) and, or some, we just only communicate via text, but um, you know, we, we really want to help elevate this profession because like I said, like my husband and I had less than stellar real estate transactions. Now we happen to be type A on steroids. So maybe our bar is too high, but I do feel that a lot of times, and I'm sure you feel this way when you go meet with people and you, you if you ask them, how are your prior real estate experiences? More than 50% say not so great. So I don't want to feel like my industry is letting people down and I'm sure you don't. So our goal as a team is to really serve our clients. And we do, we show up, we follow up. We keep in touch. We gift our clients twice a year religiously. They say to us, some of them bought a house 10 years ago. They say, when do we fall off the list? Never, because you're you're a part of the Francie Molina team brand. You're part of our family. And we're always doing things in the communities. We have volunteer fire departments and all that stuff in Westchester. So we're always running events and doing things. We're going to run some events at the farmer's markets this fall. We try to stay you know, right out in front in the communities. Now you also founded, and by the way, very well said. Um, uh, but you found you were co you were co founder of the Women of Compass Clubhouse. Tell us about that because I that's the first I'm hearing of it. Mm-hmm. But I think Compass, uh, in so many ways, is at the forefront of of some uh, some of some more progressive sort of uh, ideas. And so I'm curious. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So Compass has, I mean easily 40 affinity groups out at compass, black at compass, women of compass, et cetera, name it, they've got it. And if they don't, you can dogs at compass and you and I are dog lovers. Um, You know, if they don't have it, somebody founds it and and on workplace people meet up and and do things. So, um, so because 50% of the profession, I think more than 50% of the profession is women, women of compass was founded early on in urban compass days like that. It is a nationwide affinity group and it's very, very active. I'm a regional leader for that. So I lead Connecticut, Westchester and New Jersey. And um, some of my colleagues decided to found a a women of compass clubhouse that would meet every Thursday morning, 830 AM on clubhouse and dragged me along. I wish I could take credit, but they really did it. I was the one who was going to fill the room. So, um, so we have an agent from Philly, Stanford, Connecticut, and Austin and me, and we invite, um, agents, leaders, employees, people from outside of the industry every uh, for 45 minutes um, every Thursday morning. We're off for the summer now. We'll start back up in September. And it is really, it's a, like a, it's a place you come, you're vulnerable, you're honest. We talk about cancer. We talk about death. We talk about real estate, anything. Um, uh, our, our CEO's wife, Benice Refkin, who is amazing, and, and, and his mother, both have been on it, and they're both amazing in their own right, but they, they had, you know, the audience in tears with both of their stories, so it's, it's really special, uh, and we took the summer off just because it was, it's harder, um, especially because a lot of our guests are on different time zones to get people, you know, at 8.30, which sometimes is their 5.30, so we figured we'd give people a break. 
I want to pause for a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, our, one of my favorite companies out there, Follow Up Boss. Now, after interviewing hundreds of top realtors in the country for this podcast, do you know which CRM is used by more than any other by our guests? Of course, it is Follow Up Boss. And let's face it, following up is the key to taking your business to the next level. Follow Up Boss will help you drive more leads in less time and with less effort. Do not take my word for it. Robert Slack, who runs the number one team in the U.S., uses Follow Up Boss, and he has built a $1.5 billion business in just six years. Follow Up Boss integrates with over 250 systems, so you can keep your current tools and lead sources. Also, the best part, they have seven-day-a-week support, so you'll get the help that you need when you need it. And get this, Follow Up Boss is so sure that you're going to love their CRM that for a limited time, they're offering Keeping It Real listeners a 30-day free trial, which is twice as much time as they give everyone else. And oh, yeah, yeah, no credit card required. So you can try it risk-free, but only if you use this special link. Visit followupboss.com forward slash real. That's followupboss.com forward slash real for your free 30-day trial. Follow up like a boss with Follow Up Boss. And now back to our episode. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great thing. And I just love that you have created this um this weekly sort of th- I mean you're doing a lot. How in uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm 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 jumbling up my words. How <laughs> you do it all the time. Well, you, no, because you're you're a big uh, you're a big process person and a habit person. Very Let, t- tell me tell me tell us our audience about your habits. Let's hear some of your real estate so, habits that are important. Yeah. So, and, and our team manager, Trevor, is a, is a systems and processes guy. And thank God, because the industry, well, everything that we do in any deal, buy or sell, is, is pretty robotic. You pretty much do all the same things every time. There's nuances to every deal. But the truth is, if you look at your, you know, your transactions, they're all, they all take very similar paths. So Trevor joined us over three years ago, thank God. And he put in a a system in place for literally everything we do. So there's a template for congratulations, you have an AO, Mr. Seller. Congratulations, you have an AO, Mr. Buyer. Um, you know, congratulations, you're in contract, Mrs. Seller. And it, 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 and then it links to whatever all of our resources, whatever their next steps are. Um, obviously has checklists for every step of a listing, a buy, all the documents, etc. But through Trevor and through 6 AMers at Compass, which is another affinity group that meets at 6 AM, I've developed some very regimented habits of just, you know, waking up, you know, you say your gratitudes. I don't know if everybody does, but you have three things you're grateful for. And then, um, like I said, checking the hot sheet. I am uh, the queen of uh, uh, the Remarkable Two. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but no. It's like what's the, the? Tell us what the queen of the Remarkable the, Two are. The Remarkable Two is the thinnest tablet on the market, and it's really just a thousand notebooks in one. And so ev- I and I and I all my team has one now too. So I map my week. So on Sunday night, I've mapped my week, so I know exactly what I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three. Thursday, Friday, and it's time blocked, right? So that I'm being efficient. And then on on the night before I'm in my remarkable, I'm doing my Monday or my Tuesday or my Wednesday to-do list and fine tuning it. So after I wake up and do my, my, my gratitudes and go downstairs and get my iced coffee and let my dogs out, like I'm looking at that list and I'm just assessing what's the first thing I have to do and then, you know, getting my head set on that and then possibly looking at the hot sheet on the MLS to see what's gone into contract overnight or what's come on and that kind of thing. And then I kind of, unfortunately, the phone drives my day. Then uh, inevitably <laughs> I have a plan and the phone rings, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost, you know, uh, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty religious about getting all that stuff done before I hit the ground running. Curious too, because you do so much volume, your team does so much volume. How do you really set boundaries in place for work-life balance? I'm curious how you do that or don't you do that? (laughs) Right. No, I was not great at that. I would say up until two or three years ago and a combination of Trevor and the girls on the team, all of our producing agents are female. Um, So coincidentally, but um, they're taking on so much of the business that it's really helped me have a work-life balance. Um, So most of the buyers they're handling, which is so amazing. And I'm sharing a lot of listings with them or referring them to them so they can handle them. So I can help run the team, you know, do the rainmaking, do these kinds of things. And also like, 
I'll fly to Naples and do a Women of Compass luncheon with 16 agents to talk that, you know, about what they're seeing in the market and, you know, just to, to run events that bring agents together so we can collaborate and talk about how to make the industry better. So I love that stuff. So having the team helps me have more time to do that. And then, of course, I'm a skier and I love the lake. Uh, sure. So I, 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 our, on our team, we time block our, our leisure. So for years, I've been saying to the team on our Tuesday meetings, you know, you put in your whatever it is, you know, nephew's birthday party and nothing changes it. You go, right? I mean, if, if, if somebody on the team can't cover you, then we lose the buyer we, you know, or the seller fires us. Like this is not, I always say we're not treating cancer because my father treated cancer for 60 years. So, you know, we, you, you time block your leisure and you don't let it go. That's a really, really smart thing. And, and do you, do you ever, uh, I always curious about how realtors set boundaries around time, because if you get a text, uh, in the evening, like, let's mm-hmm. say you're it's kid, it's, you know, time with the family, what mm-hmm. are you doing? Are you responding? Because text, text conversations never officially end. Right. right. Um, they don't, they, they start, but they don't usually ever officially end. So what, what's your thought on, on responding to text? Cause and I know it's like, we're getting into the weeds, but I think it's a I love good the weeds. weed to get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Let's tell me what you, what your thoughts are about uh, texting. Yeah. I have a do not disturb on. So I almost won't oh, I, by eight or nine. Now I used to respond at 3.00 AM and I used to get up at 5.00 AM and write to clients and be, you know, they'd be writing me back at 5.00 AM. And I'd be like, wow, I tried to get that out of the way. And now they're, you know, I'm in a a conversation with them. Um, But in the, over the last few years, as I focused more on work-life balance and most of my focus on it was also to help my team because I'm, I'm modeling bad behavior when my hair's on fire all the time, then their hair's on fire. And then their poor little children are going to be raised in a family that's, you know, on a treadmill all the time. Um, So do not disturb. And, you know, I choose wonderful clients. A lot of my clients are doctors and I just adore them. I'll respond because they're mostly reasonable and they were in surgery probably all day. Uh, But for the most part, they, they, the client gets a do not disturb and it's silenced and they'll hear from me in the morning. And I was telling the team an example the other day at Father's Day, 7 a.m., the client started on me with just like really stuff that could be dealt with during business hours. And you know, and they have the tendency to text like 50 texts. And I wrote, it's Father's Day. I have a house full of people. I'll respond to you during normal business hours. And it was, everything was fine. The next morning I hit them at, you know, 8 a.m. and enough, the world didn't end. So we're really trying to help each other, remind each other that, you know, we deserve respect too. We work really hard. We work seven days a week. So evenings with the kids or Father's Day or Easter or whatever it is, you know, leave us alone. What would, if you, what, what mistakes did you make when you first started (laughs) that you, that you would love to go back and, and wish you didn't do? I made every single solitary mistake you can possibly make. I've learned from most of them. Um, But I would say, hmm, what do I wish I didn't do? Um... That's a really tough one. I wish I, I mean, I wish I balanced it better before that. I have to be honest, like I was in the Serengeti with like elephants and lions right at my feet. And I took a call from a client back in the day <laughs> because, um, and they knew, they knew you I were was on safari and mm-hmm. you were taking a call. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, again, my kids are, are, were older when I started in this business. So it's not that I've been doing this with, you know, five-year-olds. So it, it didn't feel as burdensome, but it, over time it does. It builds. There's so much noise in our head as real estate agents. And I do feel that when I tune out the noise and take a little time to whatever, to go on the lake, stand up paddle boarding or kayaking, I come up with brilliant ideas for the future of our team. And, and we need to take time to do that too. So I guess I wish I was better at that or in the earlier stages, but you know, when you're building phases, when you were building a business and showing the community that you were, you know, a, a show up, follow up agent, it really was, I didn't have the ability to do it, to be honest. Now that there's 10 of us, it, we all have the ability to do it. Yeah. I, th- I think, I think that's a great point. It reminds me of that, that old expression. Um, it's the space between the notes that makes the yes. music. Yes. So it's, it's the silence that actually yes. uh, allows for creativity to sort of flow through. And, um, and in this idea of 
getting quiet um, yes. does sometime it is really is can be the birth pay, birthplace of creativity. Oh, so absolutely for, for those of us that are feeling because realtors have to wear so many different hats mm-hmm. um, and and they just have so many responsibilities. It's it's easy to think busy is productive. And, and, and it may be, or it may not be, or it might be, uh, you know, you, you can judge the effectiveness of, of what you're doing based on the results that you get. But um, it's, it's easy to feel uh, busy is, is all that I need to be. Um, reality, um, I have found because I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty busy person, I have found that I actually get more done when I, when I slow down just a little bit. Um, Me too. And, and, and I liked what you said about in the intentional setting of uh, leisure activities. I mean, that mm-hmm. it sounds like, again, it's one of those things that's easy to hear and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it actually is really important because I know for me, like the only reason I'm in any sort of shape right now is because for the last two years I've had on my calendar, my personal training sessions right. um, scheduled. If I didn't have right. them scheduled, I wouldn't be able to talk myself into going to the gym because I'm just not that motivated to go to the gym. Right. But if it's on my calendar, I tend to do you it. Do and it. And I think you can schedule your leisure. Well, obviously you guys do that. Um, and, and it's also really important then because then you can give yourself fully to that, to that event, right? You can be present for that. And, um, and, and I think that's, that, that just creates a lot. It's a good recharge and a refresh. Um, when and and I tell, to- I tell the girls, I say, test it, leave your phone upstairs for an hour and go downstairs and play with your kids. Did the world end? It didn't. Right. It, I mean, it, it, you can, it's not, everything isn't urgent. And, and yeah. And most things that, and that's the other thing too, is, is there's an urgency and uh, importance scale, right? I think mm-hmm. Stephen Covey talked about that. Is, mm-hmm. is it urgent? Is it important? And then mm-hmm. there's, there's a matrix there that, that you can sort of evaluate, but but sometimes things that are urgent seem important because of course um, that's how our, our bodies are wired up to respond, you know, to, and to reward us for doing things urgently. Um, not necessarily always being important things to do. I have a question. If you were starting over today, knowing everything, <laughs> you know, now, if you had no real estate, um, you, you know, n- you have all your experience, but you're starting over now as a new person, we drop you off in a new country where you don't know anyone, um, but you have all your experience. What would you do to drum up business? I'm just curious. It would drop you off in a new place. We'll assume you can speak the language, but yeah. you don't know the, 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 the area. You don't know the, the, the listings. You're not familiar with, uh, the, the, you know, what would you do to start your real estate practice? Okay, so I had a manager who at Call a Banker who told me that if he would just put me in a in a deli all day long and then have somebody, you know, and gen, I talk and generate business all day, and then he'd have somebody run around and actually do like all the the back end of it. Um, so if you put me in another country, I'd probably hang out in coffee shops and meet people, um, and then at the same time, of course, probably spend it, you know, every day previewing listings. So I get a sense of the, the, um, to learn the market. Yeah. To learn the market. And of course, if there's, you know, municipal stuff like we have and flood zones and all the kinds of things that we deal with radon, we have radon gas and we have asbestos and mold. I'd learn all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I'd probably just go to the local haunts and, and get to know people. Um, like I said, you know, we, we take the, it, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so we are, our, our, most of our business is relationship based. And because of that, we we start out as trusted advisors. Um, When I first got in the business, I would say to any client I ever had the the pleasure of being in front of, I'm going to eat whether I sell you a house or not, because I had I had that ability. And that I think that um, automatically, you know, relieves the stress. So I would jump into that country and become somebody, you know, a part of the fabric of that area and, you know, not chase um, and not chase. Uh, we often get calls. In fact, in the last six months, we got more than I'd like to think about from buyers or buyers' friends or sellers and sellers' friends who, you know, whoever fill in the name of the agent that they were working with and they weren't happy with their service and they wanted to work with us. So we always ask them, well, who's the agent? And 90% of the, the situations were like, you're with a fantastic agent. We love that person. We love to collaborate with them in the sandbox. This is a terrible market. Um, but, but what that tells me is 
you know, they don't feel that that person is a trusted advisor, regardless of the fact that in most cases, it was like, in some cases, it was our favorite agent. It just people were frustrated. But what can we do as an industry to like, help each other so that and, and so we would say, no, we're not taking your business. And no, you're not switching, you know, call somebody else, because you're with the best, and we can't do better. But but I would go into that country, and I would just befriend people and show that I'm not really out just for the commission, I'm out to uh, you know, help them. I, I sell lifestyles, not houses, right? So I'd learn the lifestyle and I'd start living it and sell it. Boy, you just said it all. Um, I, I don't have anything to follow. I think that is a perfect <laughs> place to wrap up because what you really said is become a fabric of the area, you know, become immersed in the area, no, be, be, become a citizen of, yeah. of your, of your community, know everything about it be part of the community, hang out in the community, meet people. Um, and, and that is, uh, th it seems like after all the years of doing the show, that seems to be a pretty consistent message that I hope our listeners take to heart is you get to, and by the way, the, the, all the, business that you're going to get from doing that is really a side effect from contributing, right? You're going to be right. contributing. You're going to be making people, uh, you know, learning more about people. You'll be developing yep. friendships and relationships yep. and learning about small businesses and helping them and, and, and really being part of the community and being part of the solutions to, to whatever issues that community might be facing. And as realtors, you have a lot of opportunity, I think, to Agreed. get involved and you have Agreed. gotten involved in a tremendous way. And here you are now with the number one selling team in the entire County of Westchester, New York. So, uh, Francie, this is, uh, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, and I, I would absolutely, I need to have you back on the show because, um, you just have um, so much to say and everything you say is so valuable. Um, but we want to thank Francie because she has to get back to work because they're closing a couple homes a day here. So she's got, <laughs> she her and her team have to get back to it. So we are going to let Francie get back to her busy team. But for anyone out there, by the way, if you are in, if you're a realtor and you have clients that are moving to the Westchester area, please consider reaching out to Francie and her team, the Francie Molina team. They would love to to talk to your clients, or if you're a realtor and you're like, I'm not getting the, uh, the, the attention I need for my firm. And you want to see what other options exist, reach out to Francie as well and see if their team might be a good fit for you. So whether you're a buyer, seller, renter, investor, or a realtor looking for maybe another place to hang your license, reach out to her. She's awesome. She's super generous, of course, and incredibly, incredibly impressive and successful. Um, we are such big fans of, of Francie Molina. Please everyone visit Francie's website which is francimolina.com, F-R-A-N-C-I-E-M-L, I'm sorry, M-A-L-I-N-A.com. Link in the uh, show notes so you don't have to type that in. Also, please follow her on Instagram at Molina team. We'll also have a link to that in the show notes. I'm such a big fan of yours. Thank you, Francie, so, so much. We, uh, I, I'm so excited. We have to have you back on the show. Anytime. I love this podcast. Uh, thank you so much. And, and that, uh, that is one thing I didn't say um, if I were new in the business. And it, it didn't exist when I got in the business then, but I listen to podcasts. All, you learn so many nuggets from your podcast. It's like, oh, I feel like I've you. had coffee with everybody on it. Oh, well, that's very sweet. And we thank you for saying that. And thank you for being a listener and one of our guests. And on behalf of all of our guests, we thank you for your time. Um, also, we want to tell everybody before you sign off, please, please tell a friend about this episode. Just tell one other realtor that you can think of about Francie. And she had so many great nuggets of information in this episode. Send them a link to the episode. Send them over to our website, which is keepingitrealpod.com, or just have them pull up a podcast app, search for Keeping It Real, hit the subscribe button. And last, please leave us a review. Tell us let us know what you think of the show. Leave us a review, whatever podcast app you might be listening to the show. Let us know what you think. We take those comments to heart. We want to always improve to meet your needs better. But anyway, we are wrapping up. So we will see everybody on the next episode. Francie, you are amazing. And we are so grateful to have you. And we will see everybody next time. Thanks, Francie. Thanks for having me.